Hello, and welcome to another edition of Islamabad Today. I'm your host, Hamza Rafal Asad. Today, we're going to be speaking about the startup culture in developing countries. When we talk about the developing world, it's a developing world which is extremely dynamic and fast-paced, and you do have a youth bulge as well. And young entrepreneurs often encounter challenges to their ability to try and make sure that they can make a meaningful impact as far as the globalized market is concerned. What are those challenges and impediments? That is exactly what we're going to be examining today. I have with me co-founder of Bramers, Mr. Badr Pushnud. Mr. Badr Pushnud, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you so much, Hamza, for inviting me. All right, so tell us about the startup culture in Pakistan. I'm pretty sure that many American viewers will actually want to know what it's all about. And what is Bramers all about? Sure, thank you so much. So um, startup culture in Pakistan is very, very different, um, technically speaking, from, from any developed economy, especially the U.S. Um, and, and, you know, we have a very different set of local challenges which need to be solved, which are very different than generally uh, globalized uh, challenges. And some of the fundamental challenges in the ecosystem are actually uh, uh, lack of presence of uh, venture capitalists. There are a handful of investors uh, locally who are now national investors as well. There are U.S. companies now investing in Pakistan as well. But uh, earlier, just a couple of years back, there were no foreign investors. They were traditional business investors, but not venture capitalist investors for startup ecosystem. And even the local ecosystem was is still very nascent. So even if any startup or a founder has a good idea, uh, scaling his or her idea is not an easy task, um, uh, even today in Pakistan. But our fundamental set of challenges are very different than the U.S. or any developer. For example, let me give you, by the way, I think one reason everyone would want to know why even Pakistan is important on the on, in this landscape. The reason Pakistan is important is because we are one of the fifth largest country by population. So There's a huge population of people, about 220 million people, who are, and where almost 50% are below poverty line who need social economic improvement and they impact the larger globe in many different ways we are geopolitically placed in a very sensitive location which most of us would understand but we have very different challenges for example uh one stark challenge we have is that we are not a banked economy less than 20 percent of the population is banked so 80 percent of the people still haven't ever seen a bank account even a mobile wallet so that's a big challenge. Until people and the economy is documented or banked, there is nothing documented. Hence, we have a very cash-based informal economy. Hence, you can't make any policies. You don't have any data, uh, which is significant. And, and that's a, a kind of a vicious circle we need to get out of. What we have is majority of the people do not pay direct taxes. And the stock figure here is that less than 1.5% people pay their taxes uh, uh, as a direct tax. So the government has to impose a lot of uh, indirect taxes, which eventually impact the whole of the population, where, and which means that the poor are burdened as well, in addition to uh, the ones who can afford it. Then we have other challenges, like we were just talking earlier about the connectivity issues, power shortages, and power. When if we have the enough uh, power production, we do not have very reliable distribution systems. Um, so basic utilities, fundamentals, healthcare, education, access to education, access to healthcare, access to finance, access to capital, access to markets, infrastructure. There are tons of things where from an average person's point of view, these are problems. From an entrepreneur's or a founder's perspective, these are challenges that can be solved. So people who, are, uh, uh, who have that vision, they are trying to solve uh, one small step at a time. They're trying to pick one small problem and then trying to address it and solve it. So uh, some of the uh, key areas where startups have really explored uh, yeah. Pakistan, the first one was mobility, where ride-sharing companies like Kareem, Uber, all of them came in. Uber came in, of course, as an established company. Kareem started as a startup and kicked off well, Pakistan, the UI. rest of the Middle East. Yeah. Correct. But their back office was mostly Pakistan, and one of the founders is Pakistan. Right. So hence, you can partially say it was kind of, there was some element of in that right. startup. Correct. Right. So that was there. Uh, but then there were companies like Airlift, which really came to the news because they just before COVID, they started uh, ride-sharing from a public transport perspective. 
but during covid they had to immediately um pivot and they completely pivoted to a new uh, vertical which was retail so they wanted to then fix the grocery or the quick commerce part and they did well but eventually because of some of internal issues they uh, and and some of the unit economics issues they eventually immediately abandoned the business although they from a very consumers perspective they were they were really doing well and this quality of service and the delivery and all of those were doing well so uh, sorry for a long answer but partners and startup ecosystem yeah. still has a lot of opportunity in itself we need more founders we need more founders who are solving local problems we need more founders who are creating products for the larger world we need more investors from abroad of course who have experience in venture capital who, who can explore this as large market population wise and area wise as well we need more local traditional industrial investors to think more like a venture capital and start their venture arms some of them have already done that so we have you know, some local industry uh, conglomerates who have now started their venture arms and they are investing in local startups we need a lot more early stage investors which means we need more um a uh, uh, very small ticket size investors give the first kick uh, to a, a reasonable idea and test the market quickly as a proof of concept uh, we need more mentors we need more uh, 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 government initiatives the most important thing we need if you were to ask me are the right government policies we need incentives for startups in terms of tax benefits we need more support we need more or curriculum in in our graduating classes around entrepreneurship we need to encourage people to create more jobs trust the mindset needs to be changed even at the education how the education level as well uh, so uh, but the landscape overall just to give you a figure um in, in the last few years pakistani startups have raised formally they have raised about anywhere between 800 million to a billion dollars overall which is very very small globally speaking but from a pakistani perspective that's a reasonable uh, amount of uh, money they have raised and i think there's a huge opportunity some of them are doing well and i think they need uh, to now grow further some of them are in health tech ed tech which are very important basic fundamental spaces and i think there's a huge opportunity for um, for new investors to come in and support other initiatives as well uh, overall in the larger if you look at the larger tech industry uh, from pakistan last year pakistan's tech industry exports were around 2.6 billion dollars mm-hmm. we believe so this is the official documented figure from the state bank of pakistan we believe uh pakistani companies are earning 3 to 5x more than that uh, but not all of those uh, all of that income is coming back into the country so about 2.6 billion and um and 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 we believe that can be grown again significantly in in multiples uh if the right policies are in place um by by the federal government uh but but just to give you the context those exports are now the second highest exports after textiles in pakistan's economy and they employ about uh 300 to 500000 employees right now and we have about the same number of freelancers working as well uh who are working for international platforms the reason i make actually is that a lot of founders actually come from their this background they have some kind of a tech background or they are doing freelancing but they come up with an idea they learn from the larger uh, uh base and then they start developing their product digital product which is the easiest to do and then they scale up um but there are some great initiatives which have helped the ecosystem largely as well so from uh, there's an there was an initiative by ignite which is under ministry of it where they have the incubation center so now pakistan has about a uh, good eight to 10 incubators in different cities across pakistan so you have proper formal startup incubators then there are uh, private sector accelerators and and initiatives where they are helping uh, them as well and uh, there's a big move to bring entrepreneurial curriculum um, at the graduation and the undergrad level as well so um, so that's where we are right now in pakistan now so other yeah that's just fascinating it just clearly show that there's a lot of potential as far as the startup culture within pakistan is concerned i mean you gave figures 2.6 billion is a pretty impressive amount in general when we look at you know the economic quagmires that pakistan's actually been facing the fact that the startup culture is actually producing something is considerable now tell us a little bit about bramers as well 
Sure. So, uh, Bravers was born uh, way earlier than the startup ecosystem kicked off in Pakistan. So, um, so uh, we, we have three friends, and the name Bravers comes from Badr, Ahmed Zishan. Uh, we, we were in the market, we were professionally engaged with different organizations, secretly after graduation, but then we all, we three, we three thought that we should have as well. So this is going back to dating back to 2006, five, six, and we established a, a company and we wanted, we started actually uh, from a servicing perspective. So we were doing online freelancing initially very, very briefly. Uh, and and we were servicing few international clients, and then we started servicing local clients. We were one of the first digital marketing agencies in Pakistan, which was Google certified earlier in the day, and then as soon as Facebook came in, we were also Facebook certified as well. Uh, so we used to work, work with both of these principles very very closely. And over a period of time, we realized that servicing is 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 very. Um, uh, human resource dependent, very talent dependent in terms of uh, if you want to scale, the more you want to scale in terms of servicing, the more resources you require. Um, so we also ventured into product. So we have a couple of products. Uh, one is called Fishy, F-I-S-H-R-Y dot com, Fishy dot com. It is an e-commerce platform um, for, for the emerging markets, especially focusing on uh, early stage entrepreneurs, small businesses, and, and retailers who want to set up their own, who are focused on their own brand development. So we enable these brands and SMEs to set up their own stores online um, very quickly and easily. So the more important thing is easy because we realize that these small businesses do not have dedicated IT or technology resources. So they need an easy to use platform which has pre integrated payments, logistics, everything. So we do that. So we power about um, uh, uh, over 100 plus. Uh, local merchants in Pakistan. We are now looking into expanding that. We we believe we have done the proof of concept and the product market fit. We now want to scale it to other emerging markets and the larger uh, global landscape as well. Another product we have, which is more related to uh, your larger ecosystem from a news publishing perspective, yeah. and and uh, and and that is um, publisher p u b l i s h r r not e r r r dot com. So it's a content management system for news media companies. So we power a few dozen uh, news media companies, the newspapers, their websites, and their mobile apps. So it's a tech stack which enables newspapers to publish their content, uh, rich content, text, video, everything. Um, because we again realize that most of these news organizations, their core business is news and content creation uh, and content aggregation. Uh, so they need cutting edge technology, and that's what we provide them so that these websites do not go down when they get a breaking news or a high traffic uh, content. And we help them then monetize that content as well. Uh, so we are, we are into servicing, but we, are also, we also have product ventures. Uh, so that's uh, what largely Bremer says. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you take a look at news agencies all across the world, I think going digital is the way to go these days. And when you talk about going digital, it's also important to target that segment of the population, which is considered to be the youth bulge, especially in the developing world who are less concerned about, you know, sitting in front of the television and more concerned about making sure that they could, you know, just read a quick two-minute report from an app or from, you know, from YouTube for that matter. So I think the fact that you're actually facilitating this is is quite an achievement. Now, brother, when we talk about, you know, I, I just want to come up with this, uh, you know, this preconceived notion that is actually shared by many Western analysts uh, who believe that serious impediments do exist for uh, startups in countries such as Pakistan. How much is this true and how much of this is a fallacy? Um, so, yes, absolutely. Uh, there are uh, innumerable impediments uh, for startups in countries like Pakistan. And I'll tell you one fundamental reason for that, if you were to pick one. Yeah. And that one is that most of these countries were colonizing, colonized at some point in time. And that period was generally the industrial era period. So most of our regulations, inherited regulations, policies, everything is more from an industrial era perspective, modified a bit to the current age, but they are certainly not knowledge economy based. And startups are mostly knowledge economy ecosystem players. So we need to improve at times certain regulations, but we certainly need to completely revamp certain regulations. And so those policy level challenges are the first impediment. 
So I'll give an example. Defining whether a startup is a product or a service or a good or a service from a taxation perspective or a tech company is, is something that needs to be done. So on, in Pakistani regulation, it is still not very clearly defined. Similarly, you also need to facilitate that. Is it because, is it the, because the, of the colonial era of law? Of course, that's inherited from that perspective. But okay. now it's been years and decades that we need to understand that we need to change that part. So someone at the local level leads to the, the challenge is that startups are mostly digitally native founders, whereas the policymakers are digital immigrants. So That's they need point. to understand how, yeah, so they need to really understand how YouTube works, how content monetization works, how online communities work, what is peer-to-peer -peer networks, and all of B2B, B2C, and how all of this works, and how democratized content creation is. So unless the policymakers really understand and are native to it, I think bringing about change is not easy. Uh, so so that's, that, but that's not the only reason I'm just sharing Similarly, I'll give you an example. Yeah, you might have noticed that Pakist Pakistani startups raised this 800 to billion, million to a billion dollars in the last few years. Before that, you never heard about Pakistani startups raising reasonable amount of funding. And the only reason was that the central bank, which is the state bank of Pakistan, changed a few regulations during this period. And this was during the previous political era and, and they changed those few regulations. And those were needed to define that there can be a holding company abroad and there can be an operating company in Pakistan. This is generally technically known as ORCO and an OPCO. Once you, there are a few other regulations. One, those things legally, then startups can raise funding in the ORCO abroad and then bring required cash to Pakistan for the operating company. And that's how investors are also kind of protected and the startups also start getting their funding. But this framework was not allowed in the Pakistani regulation earlier. So yeah, that was, as soon as my it next allowed, question, we talk about the bureaucracy in general. I mean, the bureaucracy must have been resistant to this entire idea. Why they're bypassing us? Why they're bypassing red tapeism? Why they're bypassing all these regulations that we put in? One of the reasons why investors get scared of actually coming to countries like Pakistan is because of this. Absolutely. But there are few gems and champions in the bureaucracy. So if you find the right champion, he or she will take you a long way. So I will give you an example. So Pakistan drafted its first e-commerce policy in 2019, late 2019. Since then, under that policy, and I was part of that uh, uh, kind of larger team which which uh, kind of drafted that part. So it was a public-private partnership which which really went well with Ministry of Commerce and the larger private sector. And that policy, we had action items against it. And those action items just started executing with all the relevant policy um, ecosystem players. So from the central bank to the tax authorities to everyone. Some of them were very responsive and some weren't and still aren't. But those who were responsive, I'll, I'll give you two quick examples. Yeah, please. So we worked with the central bank of Pakistan, uh, state bank of Pakistan, and we actually helped change and create two new regulations. One was called small packet micro exports. So for example, if a woman entrepreneur or an, or an artisan creates something small, maybe a designer clo a clothing or maybe a shoe or anything, maybe a wooden tray or any handicraft, and he or she wants to sell it abroad for a few hundred dollars, yeah. that, it, that shipment was never considered export, although it is actually a commercial transaction and it should be considered an export. Only a full container load sent abroad by a ship or by air was considered export. And you need to fill a proper documented e form to consider to make that shipment considered an e uh, export. So we worked with the central bank and we kind of created a simpler, easier version for small uh, entrepreneurs and artisans so that they can send their shipments abroad, even small businesses. And that can be still considered export. So from a few thousand exporters, we believe we will now have a few hundred thousand exporters in the next few years, just because anyone who can create something can now ship. Another regulation we got uh, worked out with uh, the central bank was the B2B2C use case, the business to business to consumer use case. So right now exports was all about B2B. You, one company sending products to another company abroad. 
But in this case, the B2B2C use case was when Pakistan got listed on Amazon marketplace. Right, right. So when, when you are selling something on Amazon, you are actually not selling anything to Amazon directly, but you are shipping it to Amazon. But then Amazon sells it to the consumers. So the transaction is from Pakistani business to Amazon warehouse, B2B, and then Amazon actually helping you sell it to the consumers. So that's the B2C part. So until the C part, B2C part is completed, the transaction is not complete. And our regulation did not recognize that fact. Right. So right. we actually worked with the central bank to solve that. And just to give you a high level number, our estimate is, is that around $300 million of new export or documented export has happened under these two new regulations in the last years. And this is only because the public and the private sector worked together very, very closely under the e-commerce policy. So there was a National E-commerce Council formed and some of us worked together day and night, but there were champions in the bureaucracy who helped us navigate that uh, kind of, uh, I would say, a long dark tunnel, um, which we which really was needed. But so if there's a will, there's a way. So if if the right people in bureaucracy uh, accept the fact and agree to the fact that digital is, the, and if they're open to change, bringing about change, I think we can change Pakistan's economic landscape very, very quickly in a positive way. All right, absolutely. So now you've also consulted with Google, Facebook, and Twitter as the first person on ground from Pakistan. That's quite an achievement. Now tell me about that experience and how has that really benefited you? Because the idea that you just, you know, uh, actually showcased to me, it's almost as if it also has a lot to do, if I'm not wrong, with your experiences with Twitter, Google, and Facebook. Absolutely. It was just, uh, I would say, a mind-boggling experience, uh, uh, a real global exposure, I would say. So um, I think uh, it all started with Google. Uh, so back in 2005, a friend of mine shared an email with me where Google was looking for a country representative in Pakistan. And I believe by the time I got to know about it, it was a few months already that it was floating on different forums, which meant that almost every computer science student back then would have applied for Google, uh, but um, I also tried my luck. So although I, I'm an economics graduate, I did apply for that. And interestingly, the next day I got a call back that um, you are uh, uh, you have a scheduled interview. Anyway, went through uh, a series of interviews for almost a year, and um, and and then in August 20, 2000, uh, 2006, I got admitted into Google. And, but that completely changed my landscape, my, my, my exposure, my vision, my view on how the world works and yeah. what is an opportunity largely. And the reason I'm saying this is because uh, um, Google didn't even know what to do with us. So we were part of the larger scouts. Um, and the reason they hired us was that they wanted to see in those countries where Google is popular, but Google does not have an office as to what is in that in those countries. What is happening? Why Google is popular? And back then, if, not, if I'm not wrong, if you remember, uh, there was a Google social network called Orkut. Yeah. So Google was really rumor to be Google, uh, you yeah. know, it might actually so, true. It was it was basically a Turkish uh, social media organization. Yeah, correct, mm -hmm. correct, absolutely. It was a, it was actually a Turkish engineer at Google who created that. Yeah. So it was on his name. So uh, so they sought traction in those products and they wanted to see what Pakistan was. And remember, this was a post 9/11 time. So Pakistan was, didn't have very good PR back then, uh, but eventually I got shortlisted. My idea was to connect dots between Google and Pakistan, anything between Google and Pakistan, wherever we could work together. So, so that gave me a lot of opportunity. I, I helped the Google Maps team launch Maps in Pakistan. So now you have these Maps-based startups like the Kareem's and the Ubers and the food delivery like Food Pandas and anything which is very geo uh, 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 a location sensitive product or an app is working on Google Maps. Oh, so, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So that's uh, so that's we launched Google Chrome in Pakistan. We launched Android in Pakistan. Uh, we did tons of new things. We we did a lot of Google for entrepreneurs, Google for entrepreneurs initiatives in Pakistan. Uh, we did uh, funding actually of a lot of uh, startups, early stage startups back then. So those kind of things. So that was very broad, wide, and deep as well at times. And that gave me a lot of exposure. And then uh, 
I, I spent about good nine years, by the way, at Google. And then uh, moved on. And the day I left Google, I wanted to go back to my company, Grammars. But then a friend at uh, Google who had left a little bit earlier was at Twitter and he called me that you have to now work for us for a year. So joined Twitter uh, for a while. And, uh, then Twitter. Yeah. Twitter, yeah. And then I moved on to Facebook. So all three roles were very different, very interesting, gave me, a, a, uh, opened a lot of doors and eyes for me and how things happen. So yeah, that was a great, um, I would say, dream come true. Um, even today, I think there are a lot of Pakistanis at Google, um, but very few who are really relevant to, and, and to the Pakistani market. So I had that opportunity to ex open up those doors uh, back in the day. Mm -hmm. So, uh, brother, because we're running short on time, very briefly, if you could just tell me, um, you know, for young entrepreneurs, there's a high degree of, you know, anticipation that their startups could actually fail across the world. And, you know, Pakistan developing world is not really an exception to that case. Only a minority of them actually make it through. So why do you think that's the case? And what advice would you give to them? And uh, you have to keep it very brief, which is a bit of a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um, um, there, there's several reasons, of course, tons of reasons. It could be a poor product or anything. But some of the research does show that the number one reason is that these startups actually run out of cash. They do not manage their finances properly at the initial early days. They think it's easy. They do not have the right finance and accounting people or consult them. And hence, they run out of cash very, very, very quickly. They burn that and technically mostly waste of them. So that's one reason, I believe. The other reason is that they do not do proper consumer research and they believe that whatever they are perceiving about the product or service is acceptable in the market, whereas it's not. It's maybe it, the demand may not be big enough. So that's another reason. And there could be other, but mostly it is around the business model, which is not properly tested and tried. So these are some of the, um, I would say, um, uh, basic flawed business model issues, which actually create this challenge. Um, so, so these are very fundamental issues. There's another one. It's not the right team. So maybe in three MBS trying to do a tech, tech people trying to do a marketing startup. So that's not the right connect. You need to really want to the space. I hope that was short and sweet. No, it was very short and sweet. And I think the advice is something that many young entrepreneurs should actually take home because a lot of them are into the startup culture. It looks very attractive. They're sick and tired of the bureaucracies and, you know, the lethargy that is actually so associated with government policy. So I think this advice is something that they should definitely take home and try and implement. Co-founder of Bravers, Mr. Bada Pushnu, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you so much, Hamza, for having me. So that's all that we have from Islamabad today on ThinkTech Hawaii. You can follow us on our social media pages. Do provide us with your feedback. Until next time, take care.